Give us action. <laughs> we want we want the Someone's romance. Saying, we're losing our crap. I'm taking oh, we're not I'm, prepared. I'm taking still shots, so you're still okay. Hey, still I knew what to read at King Kingmakers. I have no idea what to read at first. Uh, wait, 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 wait. You got one? No. Okay. I just I'm just making noise. Blah, 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 blah. If you have something prepared to read, you may read it. <laughs> <laughs> Just flip open a page. Oh, I can do there. that. There we that. go. Oh, okay. give me a page number. Ah. 29. Uh, this is a slow start. <laughs> this is a slow start. Okay, you can add any number to that. Right. Oh, yeah, Plus. okay. Plus? Oh, uh, one. <laughs> no, 129 or 219. Oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> Just have to have those numerals in it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm completely undermining your. You are undermining it. Plan here. All right. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna read that. There we go. Oh, should we turn on the microphone? No, I think I can do it. <laughs> can you project to the back yeah, of the room? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long march through the palace to the Suez Hall, and each step closer made Adela's stomach knot. The guards marched stiffly around her, their swords held tightly before their faces. Her newly reformed white guard stood with her, no matter the peril, she thought with a trace of amusement. Her lips quirked a bit, and she drew in a deep breath, at least as much as possible given the tightness of the corset encasing her ribs. A bead of sweat trickled down her neck. She just wanted the day over, as well as the night. More furrows marred her brow as the thought of being alone in, the room with, in a room with Clark. Her mouth drew into a harsh line, sweeping aside the humor of just a moment before. Despite what Clark believed, he would not make the decision in the bedroom or anywhere else. That was fact. She had faced and defeated more horrific things than him. Her nerves settled and she kept pace and halted before her, her guards at her sides. Zarina and a convoy of servants trailed behind. Adela briefly touched the pamphlet tucked in her sleeve. Anne Hall abruptly halted before the wooden double doors that rose almost three lengths above them. Four men stood on either side, including one of Lord Kelvin's nameless protocol officers. He consulted his leather-bound schedule. Your Highness, you and your escort will wait here until we hear the music begin. Then we will receive the signal to enter. Adela rolled her shoulders, snapped an arm back toward her handmaiden with her palm open. Zarina ran forward and placed the bouquet in her hand. The princess brought the bundle of flowers forward against her breast as Zarina resumed adjusting the gown and veil. Adela narrowed her eyes and jerked her powdered chin at the door. Let's go now. The protocol officer replied, forgive me, your highness, we wait until the signal. Colonel Anholt stepped forward and seized both brass handles. As the bureaucrat reached out to him, one of the white guardsmen pulled the weedy little man aside a bit roughly. The Gurkha officer tugged and the doors budged with a mighty creak. The guardsmen lent a hand and the great doors swung back. Anhalt and his soldiers moved to the side, leaving Adela framed in the vast entryway with her head lifted defiantly. Thousands of lilies festooned every corner of the Suez Hall. Despite the couple's rush to the altar, the chamber was still filled with thousands of guests in their finest. All eyes fell on Adela in a massive roar of turning bodies. Eyes widened and heads swiveled, searching for cues. At the end of the white corridor, Senator Clark and Lord Kelvin stood with mouths agape. The two men exchanged hurried comments. Clark was heated, but Kelvin merely shrugged. Major Stoddard, who stood at Clark's side, lowered his head to hide his laughter. The Prime Minister, who was officiating over the ceremony, glanced to his right, and in a flurry of brass and wood, the orchestra brought instruments to bear. The conductor raised his baton, and the old wedding march commenced with barely noticeable flaws. Adela had wanted a wedding with a Persian flair, but Senator Clark and the European descended powers in court, led by Lord Kelvin, pushed for a northern style ceremony. The reason, they argued, was that this marriage was the key to the liberation of the North. She had her doubts about their rationalizations, but she didn't care enough to fight. Adela surveyed the hall with cold eyes. Perhaps a manic bridal cartwheel down the aisle would remind the assemblage that she was a mentally deranged, tragic figure being bayoneted into marriage. 
She noticed Mamoru off to the side, standing near the table where she and Clark would soon sign their wedding certificate. Today, he wore his most elegant red and black kamishimo. He nodded with an expression of gentle awe, reminding her of her own appearance and the importance of the day. Then her father stepped into view, his old eyes sweeping over her. For a moment, Adela could almost see them glisten. What was it that Anhold had implied? A spitting image of her mother? Adela's expression softened, her hand reaching out to her father. He grasped it a little too quickly and guided her arm to interlock with his own. The music swelled and echoed in the chamber as the entire room rose as one. The flickering gaslight shimmered in the air as, as it reflected off a hundred crystal chandeliers, like fireflies dancing across the water. As she and her father started the long walk down the aisle, Adela turned her attention to the man waiting at the far end of the aisle. The bridegroom was in his navy blue dress uniform, brass buttons of fire in the light, and in his saber dangling from his hip. The reflections sparkling off Senator Clark's multitude of medals made him sparkle. Oops, I read that wrong. The reflections off Senator Clark's multitude of medals made him sparkle. It amused Adela, and she smiled. Her father noted her attention. You are too good for him. Adela turned to him. Yes, I know. As your mother was too good for me. Adela gripped him tighter, and the two supported each other under the canopy of raised sabers courtesy of Clark's American Rangers lining the aisle. Lord Kelvin's mortified eyes were wide as a bug as he noticed the two imperials talking during the professional processional. Good, Adela thought, and her smile widened. Clark interpreted that her joy was meant for him and came briskly forward to claim his bride. But his majesty, Constantine, stepped between the groom and his daughter. Gnarled hands reached for the delicate silk veil, taking his time, lifting the material away from her face. His fingers slid ever so lightly across her cheek in a rare show of public affection. He took Adela's hand, squeezing so hard her eyes widened. Only then did he turn to Senator Clark. He took Clark's gloved hand and placed hers in his. I give you my only daughter in hopes that the Equatorian Empire and the American Republic can unite to make our people strong enough to withstand all blows. His booming voice brought chills to Adela's skin. Clark grinned, but surprisingly followed protocol, bowing deeply. Thank you, your majesty. I will treasure her highness. Adela and our United Nations till my dying day, and defend them both with my final breath. Constantine stared at Clark, and then, after a long moment of silence, stepped back. The warmth of his large hand covering Adela's own fell away, and she took her bouquet in both hands to avoid Clark's grasp. This is it, Adela thought. The smile on her lips faded. Her eyes were hard and regal as she moved to Clark's side, a bride of duty and nothing more. Her gaze drifted to Lord Kelvin as he began to drone through the opening remarks, but the splendor of the window behind him drew Adela's attention as the lowering sun shone through and an open sky beckoned. The beautifully colored panes of glass were prison bars this day. Her eyes closed as she summoned the thoughts of happier days, playing with the cats in Edinburgh Castle, Gareth's attempt at writing, the meal the townsfolk had prepared for her. Kelvin said her name for some reason and her attention came back to the present. She tried to listen to the words and repeat them, but they meant little to her. I, Adela, take you, Miles, to be my husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health from this day until death do us part. Clark put his hand out and Stoddard stepped up smartly and placed the ring in Clark's hand. The wedding ring was an ornate masterpiece rimmed with jewels. There were the American mine chrysobals, their gold and honey tones mingling with the sherry red topaz set on either side, two oval citrines set beyond that. It was a bold wedding band, not typical for Equatoria, diamonds being rarer in the Americas. 